So this is an opportunity for me to update you on the information that we have on budget, uh, some of the important activities in the department, uh, HHS, and also uh, news around the NIH itself, as well as our NINR update. So starting first with the budget, we are, we are in that time of year of when the budget activities are quite, um, quite intense. We do not yet have a budget, which is not unusual for this time of year, although the beginning of the new fiscal year is October 1st. So looking at the, but looking at the previous calendar, you can see that this would not be um, the um, first time that we have not had a budget by, uh, in a timely fashion, October 1st. Uh, but we have, but there are, proceed there are a, a number of meetings going on right now, and, and it does appear as if the Congress is getting a bit closer to a budget, although we, we never really know for sure um, until it, it does take place. But there's a great deal of activity. And, and also, very gratifying is that there is a great deal of conversation going on that emphasizes how important the work that NIH is doing is. And so that's, um, that's very reassuring so that the, we are in a difficult economic situation currently, and so it is hard to predict what will happen, but, but the sense is that if there are additional funds, and if they could, that Congress would really like to be able to enhance our ability to do the important work that we do. So the President's budget that was proposed for us this year does include a 2.6% increase, which would bring our budget up to close to $145 million. The, um, the overall increase increase for NIH is slightly higher. Recall that the president has two major initiatives that he has identified. One uh, is the BRAIN initiative, uh, which is uh, previously identified but still active for another eight years, and also the precision medicine initiative, which he's quite enthusiastic about. So, so those two initiatives will potentially um, uh, are designated to have additional funds if they're available. But we will keep you posted on that. So the budget that as we, when we have, uh, when we have a budget, uh, we have our normal uh, budget, the allocation of the budget is in the following fashion. This is, these are act the uh, 2014 actual budget obligations. So these are real numbers. But the template or the allocation of the budget typically looks very much like this from year to year. We do not have dramatic changes. And you can see that, that the most of the money goes out in research project grants. And here, in, shown in the blue, it's 68 percent. But also, if you add the centers, the other research, and, and the training and much of the R&D, then you really um, have a number that's in excess of 80% of our budget that does go to extramural research and training. So, so it is, we are very much an extramurally based uh, organization, uh, which is why when we have cuts that it is felt as much in the extramural community since that's where all the funds, pretty much where all the funds go. But this is the template um, that we do um, go forward with. Now, looking at uh, across the Department of Health and Human Services to see what some of the activities are that, that are happening since last we met. Um, so Dr. Mary Wakefield, who many of you know from her, from her work in nursing uh, and with rural populations, and uh, previously the head of the uh, Health Services uh, Research Administration, HRSA, uh, and all the work that they do with the, Bureau, with the Division of Nursing and the, the training and workforce uh, efforts that they have. So Mary Wakefield has now been reassigned as the and appointed as the Acting Deputy Secretary for Health and Human Services, <clears throat> which means that she is the number two person in the department uh, working with uh, Sylvia Matthews Burwell. And so we're very excited for her, and we're actually very excited for the department because Mary um, will be a wonderful addition to the department. We're, you know, we feel badly for her so that they've lost her, but, but we're excited for the department, and particularly for us since we, NIH is the largest component of the department. We we do stand to benefit the most from the leadership uh, activities that she will bring. So moving
moving a bit closer to NIH uh, and what's happening with the rest of the campus. We, I mentioned uh, just a, a few minutes ago the Precision Medicine Initiative. This actually, although I put it at the in the NIH slide, this is actually a White House initiative. So this is the president's initiative. And he speaks of it often, and he always speaks of it as his initiative. But he has entrusted us to, to implement it according to his, his vision. And so really, the, the emphasis is on building a national cohort, a participant cohort, and ultimately being able to sequence the genomes of the uh, of the individuals who are part of that cohort, uh, as well as doing um, phenotyping. This is a, f a very ambitious project. It's uh, the idea is to get a million uh, enroll a million people in this project, and we have been given about a year to do it. So it is a very ambitious project. It won't all all of the analysis will not be done in that period of time, but it is expected that the enrollment of patients will occur in that period of time or close to it, and. And that samples will be um, will be collected in a timely fashion, so that the uh, there and there are two pieces of this. That's a, a major initiative that you will be hearing about because we are really um, we have a number of calls out to be able to identify cohorts and to locate patients to be able to enroll them in this study. the The other piece of it is that there are funds that are delegated or or rather um, to none of this has happened yet I should say the this is a proposal so there is actually no money that has been has been um, appropriated yet for this but the other piece of it will be um, activity in um, further since the scientists in the area of cancer have moved forward in doing a fair amount of this work but uh, but could be maxim their efforts could be maximized by um, additional funds and so that that is also uh, an important piece of the president's agenda. So that will be uh, some of the early activity that you will see in the precision medicine as we begin signing up the uh, individuals in the uh, cohort and enrolling them. So there is, and I would encourage you to go to, if you have questions or other people ask you questions about this, to go to the website because there is a great deal of activity that will be occurring. The um, advisory committee to the director will go into a working group to try to um, determine some of the kinds of questions to be asked, some of the phenotyping. We will be um, getting public comment on this. So so this is really in its early, early stages. And as I said, the actual appropriations haven't happened yet. Yet, but we are still engaged in uh, setting up and getting some of the early work done. We have a new institute director for the uh, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, this is um, Dr. Uh, Elicio uh, Perez Stabili, and he is um, he comes to us from internal medicine from UCSF, uh, and in, uh, he's uh, the head of internal medicine, but also he's the head of their center uh, to address health disparities. And so he really comes with a long history of accomplishment in. This this area, and he, uh, so we're very excited that he's coming. We expect him on or about September 1st, and uh, I know those of you that have made the, the transition from the West Coast to the East Coast know that it takes a little bit longer, but um, we, um, Hannah Valentine, who's our Chief Diversity Officer, who came from Stanford last year, uh, was very excited about being here and managed to, in the first snowstorm, slipped, and as, as you recall, because she spoke to our council with her cast on, so we've learned a little bit about relocating people. Um, Hannah reminded us. <laughs> so, but we're very excited that L LSAO is coming and um, look forward to his taking over the helm of the uh, Institute on uh, Minority Health and Health Disparities. He will be the second director there, and we um, uh, look forward to his coming and uh, uh, and uh, plan to uh, continue to engage in the number of uh, joint initiatives that we have with that institute. Uh, Dr. Harold Varmus, whom you know as previously the director of NIH, who, who came back for approximately five years to be the director of NCI, has returned back to um, his uh, home in New York City. He uh, enjoyed his time here. He uh, really said that when he was here as, as the NIH director, he thought that all the fun was, uh, was being an institute director, that that's where all the excitement was. 
was. And so he did come back, and I, I think he um, proved to himself that he, not that the other job wasn't fun, but but that this actually he really did enjoy, and instituted a number of changes, uh, provided some stability for the institute, and instituted a number of changes, um, one of which was providing the basis for moving forward on this uh, precision medicine initiative. So, so we will miss him and his keen intellect. Recall that he shared the uh, Nobel Prize with J. Michael Bishop in 1989 for the early, early, very early work on oncogenes, and uh, and continues to be active uh, as a scientist and um, with an intellect that is lively and stimulating. And so we will miss him here. Also, uh, Dr. Jack Whitescarver is stepping down from he uh, as uh, the director of the Office of AIDS Research. Jack has been in that job for. A long period of time now, but but even before that, he's always been a researcher in the area of uh, of AIDS and HIV, and so he's really done a remarkable job. That's that's an interesting job. Recall that we have a separate line for the AIDS budget in our um, appropriation. The NIH gets its yearly budget. Each of the institutes has a line item, but part of our budget, the AIDS part of the budget for all of us, is in a separate line item, and and that's a considerable responsibility that Jack has uh, chaired for. Uh, a very long time now, and um, so he's stepping aside. He's retiring, and so um, uh, Robert Isinger, who is currently uh, an AIDS researcher, will be uh, assuming the acting uh, role um, when uh, as Jack steps aside. So we will miss him. He actually has been at NIH a, quite a long time. He was one of the early pioneers in um, the Allergy Institute and in the area of HIV. So we we do. Um, I, you're aware of the fact that we have a number of workshops and we have a, a number of expert groups that are called in to help us on uh, scientific issues and, and often issues that, that bring uh, scientific evidence to bear on policy. So we have a central office at NIH that's part of the prevention initiative and, and has been placed there administratively for reasons that are, precede all of us in the room. But it is the group that that holds the state of the science conferences and also used to provide guidelines. Um, and we more as the science moves forward so rapidly and, and sometimes in fits and starts and not in the smooth line, we tend to hold more technology assessment conferences really to say, okay, this is where we are now as opposed to here's where the science is and all this is settled. And so one of the technology assessment conferences that was held recently was as a result of the TransNIH or uh, TransNIH group on pain, the pain consortium. And many of you recall that that's a a fairly active group whose goal is to coordinate the pain research across the campus. And right now there are close to 17 institutes that have a very strong investment in the area of pain. We are one of them and we're one of five institutes who co-chairs this initiative. So one of the recurring issues that is brought to our attention is that of opioid use for pain and opioid overuse or misuse. And so an expert panel was convened uh, to address this issue. And, and these panels are important because they are considered neutral. They get people who are experts in the field or close to the field, but they do not pick the people who are those who are on the horns of, of the issues. So they try to get groups that are informed but somewhat neutral. And so once we ask them, ask the group to convene, we really have no input into it. They convene the experts and, and we are really protected from uh, any, any more input or any more information. And so, but the report, the, the conference has been held and the report is available on the website. And so what, they, what this group did was to identify uh, the barriers as they saw them to evidence-based patient-centered care uh, for patients with pain, experiencing pain, and also identified that there was more research needed for understanding the different types of pain. You know, we tend to speak of pain as a collective, um, 
and that understanding the different types of pain, and and this is also this is an area which is quite interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, and and the group recognized that and and said that really rather than he have each team member treating or different people assigned to it or different disciplines assigned to it, that it really should be a team effort and that the team should work much more closely together so that they could interdigitate their particular uh, approaches and have a much more satisfactory outcome. One of the big, big areas, which was why this uh, meeting was convened, but the big issue was centered on management and alternative to opioids, that, that, there, that opioids are necessary, but that they should be used appropriately and should be managed carefully, and that alternatives to opioids should be explored, uh, keeping in mind that the optimal goal is therapeutic uh, treatment of patients. So, so it was a very extremely um, lively discussion. There was a fair amount of uh, difference of opinion along the way, and the group did come to a reasonable consensus. So if that is uh, that is an area that is of particular interest to you, I would refer you to this. It was um, a very stimulating couple of days, I have to say. Uh, now, as part of the pain consortium effort, we also have a essentially an, an update or, or each year have an annual consortium that does deal with what are some of the advances in pain, what's some of the latest research, what are some of the latest issues. And and we tend to we tend to rotate between a more basic and a more clinical approach. This time we decided that we would look back to see what we've learned and look to the future of what what are the still the gaps and the challenges that are awaiting us. And we thought that we, the plan was that we would have a little bit more interdigitated so that we'd have a little bit closer uh, association between the behavioral and the biological. And so it, it, that, it looks like I think we, we won't know for sure it's being held on the 26th and the 27th, but that's the plan and it does, uh, the program is designed to, to be able to do that. So I think we're moving a little bit more toward the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary goal that we have set for, for ourselves and, and for um, all all of those who are doing research in this area. So we've also, we've had a number of visitors uh, over this last year. Uh, most of them have been um, uh, senators and congressmen and a few from the department. And so we had a different kind of visitor this time. Uh, so Valerie Jarrett, who's a senior advisor to President Obama, who is uh, herself a lawyer and has a, a great deal of experience with the SEC and a number of other agencies before joining his administration, came to campus to um, have an afternoon conversation with us and with Francis and us, and to celebrate 30 years of advancing health equity based on the original report 30 years ago of Margaret Hatcher, who was then the secretary. And so it was a chance to look at the progress that has been made and the progress that is, is yet to be made, and also was uh, in, in combination with the National Minority Health Month. So, so we had, and that visit is also on the, uh, the NIH website, it's archived. And, and so she was very interested in what we're doing, had a number of really good questions, and really um, was very tuned in and, and very articulate of the effect of, of, of health, good health and, and, uh, and not good health, poor health, and also the impact of starting early with young people to introduce healthy behaviors. So, so we had a, a very good visit. She enjoyed being here, and we very much enjoyed having her come. So updating you on some of the initiatives and the announcements that are out, recall we have the NIH-sponsored activities, most of which we participate in, in addition to our more unique and more mission-specific announcements uh, for funding opportunities from NINR. And so this... Uh, these, these are the current announcements that are, are active, and you can see these are themes that are very, very close to our mission for the most part. Um, the overlapping pain conditions, uh, health disparities, the AIDS-free generation, and also I would bring to your attention the Lasker Clinical Scholars Program. I would encourage you to take a look at that. That is an NIH program that we um, collaborate with in, with our intramural program. We have one Lasker Clinical Scholar, Jessica Gill. You've heard of uh, her work in the area of traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And, and so we would be very interested in getting additional scholars in that, um, in that group. So if any of you um, 
will go on the website. I would encourage you to go on the website, find out a little more about it, and also talk to Ann Cashin because we would be very keen on adding to that cadre. So moving a little bit closer to home here, what's been happening here? A lot. Uh, but uh, but uh, I mentioned, uh, once again, a uh, very big welcome to our new council members. We're very happy to have you on board. We have a, an extremely good um, and active council. We, we do encourage uh, discussion on all sides of the issues and, um, and really do appreciate the energy that you put into it and also the amount of work that it is for you. So as I was saying, this morning, we invite you to be part of the council because of your expertise, and then we ask you to be a little bit more of a generalist to be able to look at all the science that comes to us. So it's a, but it's a challenge. I, th I, I know this new group will be up to it. So. We continue with our NINR director's lectures, and we have a particularly interesting one. Uh, they've all been fabulous so far, but we have a little bit of a different um, uh, focus on the one that's coming up in June. It is, uh, will be presented by Mary Sue Heilman from University of California, Los Angeles. And, and so she's going to be, her particular area of, of interest, um, she, she's very interested in health disparities and, and, liter and literacy, but she in particular also it focuses on the role of the nurse and, and the image of nursing. And so she will be talking to us about from the silver screen to the web, which is portrayals of nursing in the media, and it promises to be a really fascinating talk. So for those of you that can't be here, which will be uh, probably a large, a large percentage, we will have that archived and so it will be available on the web. We also had our National Nursing Research Roundtable in, in March of this year. And this year, recall, we partner with one of the many agencies for whom, or, or groups for whom research is a big part of their agenda. And, and so this year, we, par we partnered with the National League for Nursing. And the focus was the nexus of practice, research, and education for the health of the nation. Um, Eileen Sullivan Marks came and managed to get her through the snow. We were kind of, that's the only event this year year that we were almost snowed in for. Uh, and, but she, she made it. They, they drove down from New York, and uh, so she made it. So we kicked off the evening in fine fashion and had a really uh, good and lively discussion the next day. And the publication that summarizes that will be coming out um, in, shortly, and we'll, that'll be on our website. The, the, um, the link to it will be on the website. Some of you have been asking about the Innovative Questions Initiative and what was the summary. So, so I have, uh, so we did a little summary of it, and so I put that is in uh, the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. Um, we have a, a editorial person here who, who seemed to um, think that would be a really good thing for the readers, and um, it turns out actually that evidently it has been uh, gotten a number of hits, and uh, but it really it, it was downloaded. Okay. Top five most downloaded for the whole year. That's wonderful. <laughs> so the word is getting out. Um, but it is a, a short piece simply to summarize uh, the uh, Innovative Questions Initiative and to direct people to, to the website as well. We do have all the, sum all the summaries of the questions are up now, and they incorporate both the group activities and, 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 uh, and recommendations, but also the general public recommendations that we received on the website. So we're very enthusiastic about that because it really does set us up for our next iteration of our strategic plan. Now, we've all just finished, uh, as you have, as uh, we have finished the regional, attending the regional conferences, the research conferences, which have been very, um, very well attended this year. A lot of students, a lot of excitement about the research, which is really good to see. And so we just, um, so, we also um, attend it. We attend from a programmatic point of view, and the program directors are there in full force. But we also attend from an intramural perspective as well. And so this shows you the list of our intramural researchers who participated in those regional conferences and what the papers or abstracts that they presented were. And we actually, they all did very well and generated a lot of excitement. But um, Kristen Weaver, uh, whose work um, with irritable bowel syndrome is, uh, is, is very exciting. Um, she's relatively new 
and um, going places fast, we think. Anyway, her, her um, particular presentation received first place, and that was very exciting. So she's excited. She's fired up now for a career in research, so thank you all to the regionals. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of of scientific findings that are of particular interest. And the the links for those or the references for those are on the slides. So I won't spend a lot of time, but just to bring to your attention some of the things that are going on that are pretty exciting. Recall from a previous presentation, Jean Kuttner presented to council on, um, on her work in palliative care and end of life, primarily focusing on the palliative care research cooperative study and all the all that's happening uh, in that particular study. And and so recall there um, a, uh, there are six. 60 groups enrolled in this now, participating in this across the nation, which is an enormous number, exceeding what we thought they would be able to do. And so they, the idea was that the cooperative would be there and that the studies would be done with this infrastructure. And so that is now beginning to happen. And I, so I'm bringing to your attention one of the earlier research findings, and that is the question was asked, are, you know, should should we continue statins for people who are uh, in pall receiving palliative care or who are approaching end of life? Will it make a difference one way or the other? And so they, the idea being that the more medication you can stop, the the better, if and less people need it. And so they did the study and they found that there were no significant differences in mortality between those stopping and those continuing the statin <coughs> use, and that the quality of life improvement was reported by those who stopped the statin use. So so we feel that this is a really important finding and will help us to improve the care of people who are at this very precarious stage. Another uh, another uh, study that is interesting and, and really in its early stages, but the first findings are very promising, is that we this and, and this was uh, uh, was published in Nature that a group decided that in order to help people increase mobility, those who had mobility issues, that um, something like an exoskeleton, but it was really a, a, a sort of a robotic ankle and lower leg support would be very helpful, and and so they created this um, exoskeleton that really does reduce the cost, the energy costs and the effort that's required for walking and, and allows people to walk more easily and therefore to be able to continue their activities of daily living and increase their quality of life um, by a considerable amount. And so this is now that this works in principle, it will be tested out in other patient populations such as people with stroke and people with muscle, muscular weakness of, of a variety of types. So so it's it's an early but successful finding and we thought that was really pretty exciting and and it was published in, in Nature magazine but also picked up in the Washington Post and you know how you know how Washington only we're, they're very fussy about the science that they publish so we were exci we're excited about that um, a, a third finding um, uh, was that um, is is that in the area of sleep apnea and and we know that one of the one of the treatments that's very popular um, for sleep apnea is the CPAP uh, apparatus and and you know we we've, we've funded a number of studies about whether or not the spouse accepts it will that increase usage et cetera so we we've, we've looked at it from a variety of of standpoints but this this study looks at at the one of the issues of why people don't use it and that's the issue of claustrophobia. It makes them feel trapped. And uh, so they did find that um, that occurred more often in women than men, in uh, individuals who were obese, and also <coughs> tested using full face masks rather than small masks. And it does make sense that the more of, of the person's face that's covered, the more claustrophobic they would feel. But that also gives us the impetus and the data to be able for um, for the companies to be able to modify um, what they're doing. And this is uh, this is interesting on its own right, but it's also interesting if you notice that it comes from a uh, relatively um, new investigator who's on a K99 and R00. So it's a very nice piece of work from an early investigator. So we're excited about that. We helped, we worked with the Institute of Medicine and had a council member and other members of the scientific community on the panel who produced the report, Dying in America. And, and that is a, 
the Institute of Medicine report that is actually one of their most top three most downloaded reports in the history of the Institute of Medicine. The uh, It's about the third to fourth most downloaded, but it's still recent. The Future of Nursing report, which is several years old now, is the most downloaded report that they have. So so we feel like we're um, making an impact at the Institute of Medicine, or, or now it's going to be um, the National Academy of Medicine. But we're making an impact in ways that are very positive. So, um, but I wanted to bring to your attention that we have now, we, I, I mentioned that we had sponsored a briefing for NIH of the Institute of Medicine report. And that briefing has been recorded, and it is on the website. But we have an index for it, because it's a, it's a little bit long. So you can go to the various pieces of it and hear whether you want to hear about the pediatric portion, or you want to hear some other portion, or if you um, want to hear Phil Pizzo give his overview. Anyway, you can uh, uh, dial into whichever whichever part of that briefing that you want to hear. And so I would suggest it's really it was really well done, and the attendance was was uh, well. The room was completely filled, but the overflow we had uh, two overflow rooms too. So it was it was really well attended in person, as well as on the phone, and uh, far exceeding our expectations. So reviewing quickly for you the funding opportunity announcements that NINR has put out, which you all were very much a part of. Recall that you you um, helped us to review these concepts in their developmental early developmental stages. And so these are program announcements which are active until 2018. So these are all quite current, and we encourage you to um, circulate that information. We have the NINR Methodologies Boot Camp. Recall we are doing the boot camps in the summer, the one-week boot camps for, uh, to enhance measurement uh, to study symptoms. And last year, we had such a dramatic response to the boot camp on big data and symptoms research that we increased the enrollment this year. We, we're working with the uh, FAES, the Foundation for the Advancement of Science, and we are able to... Uh, they have a very much larger facilities than we've had on the NIH campus before. And, and we were their first big client last year, so they were very excited and wanted to um, uh, afford us the opportunity to increase the enrollment. So we have increased the enrollment to 135 uh, participants this year. We have a waiting list if anybody drops out. But last year I told you it filled up in about seven hours. And I must have said that frequently because the message, the word got out, and so this year it actually filled up in even less time. So, so we were excited, but you know, there's the concern that a lot of people who really want to have access to it will not be able to. And so for the first day, where some of the major presentations are on that first day, so we are videotaping those, and they will be archived, so that if you um, are, you know, if, if you have people in your particular universities or, or settings that were not able to access it, some of that information will be available. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do next year. We're having conversations on that now. Normally, we do these for two years at a time. Um, this one has really stimulated a lot of excitement. We were also the first on campus to to hold a big data symposium of this sort. And, and so we thought that after the first year, the excitement would die down a little bit. And that hasn't happened yet, but to be continued. Also, I'd like to, um, one of our um, young investigators uh, who's part of our graduate partnership program with the University of, um, of Missouri uh, is Jennifer Dine, and she is working in the area of patients with cancer. And each year, the Cancer Center Consortium across the country gathers together, and they present the results of their research. And so all the trainees from across the country came from all of these centers. And, and Jennifer received the Outstanding Trainee of the, War, of the Year Award for her work with patients with cancer. And so she, it's very exciting for us. It's, a, it's an extremely competitive group. And she um, just did a terrific job. And so we're, we're very excited. Uh, for her. Those of you that have been on council 
um, a little longer will remember that she did one of the early presentations, the student presentations, and and was <laughs> it's still on our YouTube. But you, you probably should check out her YouTube presentation because she's very enthusiastic and and uh, was kind of a showstopper. Uh, in any event, her, her science is terrific, so we're very proud of her. Also, um, another of our intramural fellows, Dr. Kristen Filler, who is just starting her postdoc, she finished the graduate partnership program and is probably one of uh, only a few people who, will, who has elected to stay on, and she's doing a postdoc with us. And her, she's the lead author uh, for the uh, paper, Association of Mitochondrial Dysfunction and Fatigue, Review the Literature. And that has just now been, um, uh, been uh, identified and received the notice that it is the most downloaded article for this particular journal. And uh, so it's a well-known uh, clinical journal. Um, she's actually working with um, Leo Saligan and um, looking Looking at um, at uh, cancer in uh, in men with uh, prostate cancer, so she is really she's also one of those who has been an award winner at, at a regional previously. So so we're very excited about her and wanted to let you know that that's going well too, and her university is very excited. So we we also have a number of summer research students, and. And one of the things that is particularly uh, uh, noted and prized at NIH is is the ability to mentor and to mentor young people who are starting on their scientific journey. And uh, and Francis actually usually shows up for the awards for the the best mentors. And and so the we have a number of summer research fellows, uh, postbacs, postdocs, etc. And so three of our uh, three of our researchers who are still junior themselves, Leanne Sherwin, Nicholas Foray, and Jessica Witherspoon, were honored this year with the Research and Mentor Awards, uh, which is really, and they, they don't give out too many of them, so to have three in one program is really pretty amazing. So congratulations to them, and congratulations to Ann Cashin, the scientific director, who <laughs> keeps everybody tuned up to this level of excellence. So with that, uh, I would like to close reminding you uh, to save the date, October 13th. We actually, the Institute, if you can imagine, is turning 30 years of age. Some of you may remember when it began. Uh, and so it's pretty exciting. We've been on, we'll have been on the campus for 30 years. We're kicking off the uh, year of celebration on October 13th, 2015, with a scientific symposium here. The uh, the uh, agenda for that is uh, now, I think that's on the website, Ann, now? Yes, yeah. I've gotten I, either that or someone, or it got leaked because I've gotten some congratulatory notes already. <laughs> and I hadn't actually realized that it was up until I got them. So, so it's on the website. So check it out. Plan to be here. It will be very exciting. Uh, and uh, so we're really looking forward to that and looking forward to having as many of you here as possible. So with that, I will close my remarks for today. And we do have time for questions now or, or later. Oh, whoops, sorry. I have one more. I usually end with that slide. Uh, Sorry, I am Marguerite. I apologize. I almost forgot. <laughs> so I wouldn't forget, but I but we'll give you special attention now because I slipped the 30th anniversary in ahead of you. Um, so. Um, so I want to announce that um, Dr. Marguerite Engler, uh, who is um, part of our intramural program, has been with us um, for, for several years, has been appointed the Deputy Scientific Director for the intramural program. She has been acting uh, Deputy Scientific Director and um, has now assumed that position um, uh, full time and officially. And so she also holds the title of Chief of the Cardiovascular Symptoms Branch of the Symptom Science Unit. Um, she um, received her Master of Science from American University and her PhD from Georgetown University. But then she got sidetracked to go to the West Coast, spent 20 years at UCSF um, doing research there in the area of cardiovascular and has um, re relocated back to her roots um, and uh, uh, and joined us. Um, and so she is the, the deputy scientific director for the intramural program. So um, congratulations, Marguerite. So thank you all so much. <laughs>